The Reform Gamers is brought to you 100% independent and ad-free thanks to our dear patrons over on patreon.com slash Gamers to get yourself sweet, sweet perks such as uncut early access to the episodes, special episodes of the podcast, and more. Head on over to patreon.com slash Gamers and consider lending support and joining the herd. Without further ado, let's hop into the show. Hello and welcome, dear listeners, to episode 195 of the Reform Gamers, a show about theology, video games, and escape rooms, and anything else that we can think of. I am your Reformed Lawn Care host, sowing seeds, mowing weeds, Logan. And Adam, uh, unfortunately, couldn't make it to this episode. He is the preacher man. Uh, So he's busy preaching at his church, sharing the gospels, sharing the word of God with uh, with his congregation. So he couldn't make it to this episode. But I did bring on a special guest that I think a lot of you are probably familiar with, especially if you are hanging out either on Twitch, the Discord server, or even GMA's Discord, Jeff known as J-Cubed. Man, what is up? Say hello to the dear listeners. Hello there. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. what is that thing of like, what do I say? Do I just say hello or do I like, you know? But- well, I, I learned from a certain reformed Jedi about that. So that's, uh, yes. Hello there. <laughs> hello there. Yeah. <laughs> or, or as I more commonly say, hello there, nerdy party people. Oh, there you uh, go. There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that. I can, we can roll with that. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 Because uh, when it comes to me, I, I tend to bring a party. So that's, that's true. Right. Yes, that's very true. Mm-hmm. So, Jeff, just for the dear listeners out there that are listening to this episode, maybe, you know, they're not in the Discord server because I guess, uh, I don't know, they, they hate me and they want to hurt me. No, I'm just kidding. But maybe they're not in the Discord server. Maybe they're, they're not familiar with you, man. Let the dear listeners know a little bit about yourself, kind of, uh, you know, what do you do with GMA and, and those kind of things like there and, and kind of how uh, you are really into board games. Yeah. Uh, so my name is uh, Jeff. I guess I can say Jackson. Yeah, Jeff Jackson. Um, and, and kind of to explain, I, I don't know if anyone really knows this per se, a little bit of insider knowledge. There's a reason why I go by J-Cubed, uh, and this is some some lore, if you will. Um, I actually have three J's as a part of my name, but it's not because of my middle name. It's because my father and I share the same name. So that's why I'm Jeff Jackson Jr., uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so that's why I have three J's in my name, uh, and that's where J cubed came from. Uh, so th- that's uh, that's why I go by that pretty much everywhere, for the most part. Uh, but yeah, so um, I'm kind of been around uh, the reform gamers for quite a bit. Been in the Discord community, I've interacted on Twitch, um, but mainly a few things that I do. Um, I. Um, I am on staff uh, for a ministry called God Mode Activated, or GMA for short, uh, which I am pretty sure that many of the dear listeners probably know what God Mode Activated is. I would uh, hope so. We've had Pastor Deucin on this show at least, I think, two or three times now. So, <laughs> Yes. If, if they don't know, they haven't listened to those episodes. Like, what are you doing with your life? Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, like, exactly. Like, 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 what are you doing <laughs> with your life, honestly? Um, <laughs> uh, but yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll kind of reiterate a little bit. God Mode Activated is about connecting gamers to Christ and activating them in their faith. Hence why it's called God Mode Activated. Um, and the name, of course, comes from, you know, the whole idea of uh, God Mode in, in a sense. of It's a video game reference. So we, we primarily deal with being an outreach ministry in a sense. And we're, we're kind of there to equip uh, the churches that are out there and, and to serve as a, a supplement. Uh, we're always going to be uh, ones who will advocate for people to go to a local church and be connected. But we're just kind of there as kind of a way to, for gamers to kind of learn how to use their faith um, and their gaming together because they can be used together, believe it or not. Uh, so my role with God Mode Activated is I'm on staff and I am the community manager. And what that basically means is that I'm responsible for getting as much of the community involved in as, as possible. Um, and the way that we primarily do that is with community events. So I'm a glorified uh, event planner. 
in a sense. But really, what I try to do is make sure that the events are ones that kind of get as much of the gamers involved, uh, because we have a a whole bunch of different types of gamers who like things, uh, everything from Valheim to Rocket League to Apex, uh, board games, dare I say, um, and uh, and everything like that. And we kind of make sure that there's events for them, Uh, even the occasional Jackbox game or Gartic Foam, that sort of thing. Uh, And we just try to create opportunities. And my ultimate goal is to get as much of the GMA community uh, getting to know each other and, and uh, doing things together as possible and also creating a really nice, solid, uh, you know, Discord community in general. Uh, so that's mainly my role with, with God Mode Activated. Um, awesome. Yeah. So you are you are literally the party guy. Like you weren't joking earlier when you said wherever you go, there's a party. Like you are the party guy within GMA, getting everybody acclimated, getting everybody assimilated, and then having fun all at the same time. Yep. Right on. Uh, yep. Uh, I mean, like I also serve on, on connection team, which is literally the welcoming party. Um, we, we make it a point to reach out to every new person who comes in the community and let them know how to get connected and, uh, and everything like that, get them to know about the, the ropes about using the discord and everything like that and get them immediately plugged in so that they can get connected to the right people and everything like that. And so that's kind of also a part of my role as well. And that's one of the teams that we have and that's, that's by design. Uh, so yes, I'm the welcoming committee and the party committee. Right on. Both mm-hmm. of the best ones, in my mm-hmm. opinion, because mm-hmm. that, like, if you don't have either one, I mean, you have a hard time with, uh, with getting people connected with something we actually need to work on a little bit in our discord server, but because we're all adults, it's hard to you know coordinate schedules, but yeah, you know, is what it is. But that being said, dear listeners, super excited to have Jeff on the show. We're going to be talking about a couple of different uh, topics here on the show, like escape rooms, interactive gaming, group gaming, and things like that. Taking a little bit more, taking that topic of tabletop games, but words are hard. Words are hard. Words are hard. (laughs) But digging in a little bit deeper and, and expanding on that. A little bit more so i'm super excited uh, to have jeff on and for us to discuss that those topics but before we even get into those things a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show proper just want to let you all know that there are there's some new content that you can check out both on our website and on our youtube channel youtube.com slash the reform gamers it's a couple different videos on there such as is video games or are video games actually childish my reaction to the nintendo switch oled and metroid dread trailers uh back vlog episode one is on there which is my journey to defeat my backlog and and get rid of it will be available on our youtube channel and there's also articles or companion articles of those videos on our website as well, the reformedgamers.com. Really, if you go to the reformedgamers.com, that's kind of your hub for all of our content, and it'll have links to our YouTube channel from there as well. So be sure to head over there, check out that content, and enjoy it, and hopefully it'll help you out with your walk with Christ as a gamer. But with that being said, let's get into the show. So again, hello and welcome to the Reform Gamers. We like to start off the show like we always do with a little bit of what have we been playing. So Jeff, since you are the guest of honor, what have you been getting into lately? Uh, so I'm going to talk about two analog games, namely board games, and I'm going to talk about one console game, believe it or not. Uh, oh, okay. It's, it's kind of my brand to be the token analog gamer. Uh, I know barely anything about console games. I just observe and, and make inferences, and <laughs> and when people are happy, I just am happy. Uh, I don't know what else to do with my life when I'm watching other people play video games. I just enjoy it. Uh, So, hey, let's talk about the two board games that I really know a little bit more about. Although, you know. Uh, So the first one is called Palm Island. I actually have the full game right now in my hand because it is a micro card game. And what that means is it's a card game that literally uses... Uh, 17 cards to play it. Um, And so the name Palm Island actually means you actually can play the full game by holding all the cards in your hand, in the palm of your hand, dare I say. Um, What? Really? Yeah, yeah, really. Um, Looking this up. 
Yeah, you continue. I'm going to look this up. <laughs> I, I want to fill you in a little something. It, it's a running joke with me. People don't like to play board games with me, especially yeah. games they haven't heard of, because usually when I teach them a new board game, they immediately will go on Amazon and purchase it. So you're warned now. I uh, I have a friend, a friend of the show, Jonathan Seal. He's he's very much the same way. He'll he's brought up a couple of games that I've went and bought on Amazon. So <laughs> nice to know I brought up I brought on the show another Jonathan to to get me to buy some games. The good news is is that this game is rather inexpensive, so uh, you won't really be spending a lot i think it's like 20 bucks on amazon last i checked oh yeah yeah it's only 25 it's, yeah, yeah, it's not bad at all yeah yeah, it's not yeah. Bad at all. so it's a solo game and two players uh, you can actually play it cooperatively or competitively um and it also has achievements because we all like achievements there actually are achievements in this game well um, now you're speaking my love language tell me more about this game <laughs> <laughs> So essentially what happens is is uh, you start out with uh, the cards and, you, and there are 17 cards. You shuffle a few of them in the beginning and then there's a card that you put at the end that indicates what round you're on. And so what you do is you cycle through the cards and then you manipulate them. So you either like tilt them to the right to indicate that it's a resource that you have uh, or you spend the resources by putting those cards back in and then you can either flip or rotate the card and then put it in the back of the deck. And so what you basically are doing is cycling through the cards to basically try to build things. So you're building a house, you're building a temple, you're uh, building a tool kit so that you can get better resources. You're going to the trade house to get particular resources. And you're basically trying to manipulate the cards uh, to kind of build your own island. That's why it's called Palm Island. Um and, and then you basically play six rounds of it, and then you just count the stars on the tops of the cards. It's a really cool system, and that's your score. And then you basically compare your score against a, like, you know, a grading scale, if you will. Um, the other cool thing, especially in light of it being summer, is that these cards are completely weatherproof. You can literally play these car- with these cards in the water. I actually, uh, when I go to my uh, apartment complex's pool, I bring them in with me, and they are completely fine um, to play with in there. So they're actually really good to just take with you. Uh, it's a wallet-sized game, so you just take them with you, and you can just kind of pull it out while you're waiting in line, wherever, that sort of thing, and just play. And it's a nice little thing to fidget with, too. Um, and it includes two decks, so you can play with two players and that sort of thing. So so, so fun. Um, I, I, uh, you know, playing it just kind of like to keep myself busy sometimes, you know, if I'm just kind of watching something or I want to multitask or whatever. So Palm Island, real good. Highly recommend it. Uh, the second one is, uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak, which, uh, the best way I can describe it is this is a, um, it's a game that you're basically set in, uh, it's like an Indiana Jones, Atlantis, the uh, Lost Empire sort of situation, um, and you are basically trying to – you're exploring this civilization that has not been inhabited by humans, and you're discovering artifacts. You're meeting these guardians, which are these giant monsters that can invoke fear in you, um, and you're also doing some research along the way. It's kind of a nice mix. It's a Euro game, which is basically a game that uses – focuses more on mechanics than theme, um, and you essentially – uh, it's kind of a nice mix of uh, worker placement, which it means you place workers down to do actions. Um, deck building, so you're actually kind of managing a deck. It's a smaller deck. Um, and then a little bit of resource management as well with a little bit of a, a research track. So it's kind of a nice mix of everything. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, a relatively quick game. It takes about five rounds to play. Actually, not about five rounds to play. And uh it, it's really nice. Um, <clears throat> it has a nice amount of replayability. Uh, there's actually two sides of the board, so if you want a more advanced game, you can play that. Uh, but <clears throat> really good. It's published by, um, which I should probably mention what these games are published by, Palm Island is published by uh, Portal Dragon. It's designed by John Meatling. And then um, the uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak is published by uh, Czech Games Edition, I believe the the designer is Min, and I'm trying to remember. I will look it up later and get that information. But it's it's me. It's published by Czech Games Edition, um, 
and and a really good solid game. Um, and then finally, I kind of mentioned offhand, um, I am playing Sonic Mania. Uh, fun fact about me: my first game I played that was a console game was Sonic Two um, on my Sega that I had when I was about eight nine years old or so. And uh, I've always been a 2D side scroller fan in terms of like seg- uh, Sonic and that sort of thing. Uh, so I like Sonic, I like Ristar, I like all that kind of good stuff. Um, and so when Sonic Mania was announced, uh, I was quite happy because I love that OST. Um, I am horrible at video games. I cannot get past Flying Battery Zone for my life at all. It just that boss is just so hard. I, I don't know. So, you know, that's kind of what I've been playing lately, if you will. Right on. Dear listeners, I'm just going to apologize beforehand. If you hear any fireworks going off, there's some folks uh, near my house that are lighting those off, even though the 4th of July was seven days ago, six days ago. I don't know. People <laughs> are just they just do what they want. I mean, it's fine. I, I dig it. But no, you talking about Sonic the Hedgehog brought back a lot of nostalgia because Flying Battery Zone is – I don't think I ever got past that either, to be honest with you. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. That place was just was just difficult because of the the floating uh, platforms that would move over, move around. You had the different like I think there's a point where you get on top of the ship or outside the ship, and you have to connect. Like uh, why, why does it connect? You have to like hold on to the propellers or something, and like you spin right, around yeah. and let go. And yeah, I was yeah. never I was never good at that. I was never yeah. good at that. The boss is is basically it's Robotniks and he's like a spider and he has like one of those like uh, um, bumpers on him and mm. you have to like time it exactly right to hit him um, and and everything like that and I just you know it just never happens and I get through the level itself of flying colors no problem it's just that I get to the boss and it's like well yeah there and then three lives gone that's start all over again so just it throws the kitchen sink at you <laughs> at that point yeah yep. yeah it's a uh, it's pretty brutal it's pretty brutal sonic is still it's a fun game but man does it get difficult but no sonic mania is great though <laughs> sonic mania is a great game highly recommend that one as far as what i've been playing then i have guys i'm i'm gonna be honest i did not like sea of thieves when it first came out Back in 2018, 2019, thought it was a dumb game, was never going to play it. And then, and then some of my friends started getting into it and like, dude, you need to come play Sea of Thieves with us. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll give it another shot. Jack Sparrow, sure, I'll, I'll play that. And now I'm just, that's all I want to play. All I want to play is Sea of Thieves. I stayed up till 1 30 in the morning the other night, just playing the game by myself, listening to podcasts. And I was like, this is so chill. I'm just going out on the open seas, getting some getting some treasure, fighting some skeletons, and then trying to defend myself from other players because they're they're griefers is what they are. Who like to stay on your ship and then when you come back from the the afterlife, they're on your ship still, so they kill you again. And it's just like, guys, come on. I dealt with this in Dark Souls. I don't need this in, in Sea of Thieves. But it's it's a fun game. I I'm just saying, dear listeners, if any of you have a PC or Xbox with Game Pass or you own Sea of Thieves, hit me up on Xbox and and let's play together. My name on Xbox is the Theo Logan, same name I have for just about everywhere. Let's link up, play some Sea of Thieves, and get some loot because it's it's a good time. I was playing with a again friend of the show, Jonathan Steele and his brothers the other night, and it was just a blast because we were it seemed like everything that could possibly go wrong in the game did go wrong that night, but it was still a, a blast despite how many times we got attacked by a Megalodon, the Kraken, other players. It just, it's a fun time. It is a blast. Uh, I just, I, I can't recommend see if these enough, especially if you have a game pass, if you have game pass, it's worth playing. And then the other game I've been playing is Metroid zero mission, which I beat or played and beat for the first time on stream over on twitch.tv slash the theologian. I, here's the thing. I love Metroid. Y'all know this. And I knew Metroid zero mission would be a great game, right? But I didn't know that it would be one of the greatest Metroid games of all time, because when you get to a certain part in the game and I can't even say because of spoilers, but it does something different. It changes up the gameplay in a really nice way that just, the whole last section of that game 
is just incredible to the point where I think it elevates that game up above some of the other 2D Metroid games for me to where it might be my favorite over Samus Returns and Fusion. And I don't know if I like it more than Super Metroid just yet, but man, does Zero Mission hold up really well. And man, is it the blast to play. And it has not helped me be more patient and waiting for Metroid Dread. So if you are curious about my reactions to any of those, uh, really just the game at all, you can go to my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash theologian and look at some of my highlights that I clipped from the stream. Cause it just, I, I, I flipped out a lot uh, <laughs> towards the end of that game because it just, <laughs> it got so stinking cool that I was like, I can't, I just couldn't believe how good that game got at the end. It's just, it, it's mind blowing. It, it really is mind blowing. It kind of blew out of the water. A lot of these, these modern games that we have now because of the way it just, changed up the gameplay and subverted expectations in such a really smart way. It's just Metroid zero mission. I'm going to come out here and say it is a perfect game. I'm going to say that. And so if anyone disagrees and wants to fight me, uh, good luck. I guess we can try and play mortal Kombat or something, but it's like, I just <laughs> get over it. Like you know, it, it's the perfect game. It's a scientific fact. I'm declaring it here on the podcast and, and there it is. So I didn't say it. I declared it. So there's that. So let's switch gears real quick over to what have we been reading? Jeff, what have you been getting into lately, man? Anything you've been reading as far as like, you know, in the Bible or a book or, you know, let us know. Yeah. Um, so a cool thing to kind of mention as a side note, um, I'm in the midst of, I think, well, I'm actually now halfway because we're about halfway through the year at this point of a, the first time in my life reading uh, the Bible completely through. Um, I have been trying to do this for years and I finally found uh, the plan that just seemed to work. And it also has a lot to do with, you know, how it changed my attitude about how I uh, gave myself a little more grace in terms of, of reading the Bible and that sort of thing. And that really helped. Um, so I, uh, I'm halfway through and I'm, I, I give all glory to God that I got this far and I look forward to finishing it by the end of this year. Um, I will also um, probably in the show notes, provide a link to this particular plan. It's recommended by Tim Callies. Um, this is the one that he's actually doing this year too. Um, I would highly recommend it. And if there's any dear listeners who want to do it with me next year, cause I'm going to be doing it every year. Um, I love this plan so much. Um, so the cool thing is, is that right now I just this week finished reading Ecclesiastes, which um, when I first learned and like started hearing sermons about Ecclesiastes, I realized really quickly that this book is a good book to read when I am really in despair um, because it just kind of puts things in perspective in a lot of ways. Uh, because I can get in, you know, it, it's, it's, a, an opportunity to resonate with someone who also kind of feels like, uh, as, as the, uh, you know, everything is, uh, the wind is, is a hevel as, as the Hebrew would say, and nothing is new on, under the sun. And actually, if you interact with me quite a bit, that's a phrase I say a lot. Nothing is new under the sun. Yeah, um, you, you say it a lot, even in discord, like when we're talking yeah. about new events or anything, I remember that coming up quite a lot, quite a bit. Yeah. And that's, that comes from the impact that this book has had. Um, and, and the one thing I really have to say, I mean, like I struggle with mental illness and, and that sort of thing. And this book is one of the reasons why that God has used to, to heal me of a lot of that. Um, just reading through it. And then, so when I was reading through it again, it just brought me back to that place where just, just God really spoke through those, those, uh, words there to really kind of you know speak to me directly about um just some things that i really just couldn't really understand and it, this book really answered a lot of 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 questions that i had about the futility of things uh but of course we all know as christians that when we took this and we use the lens of the rest of scripture we know that it's because of the grace that we have been given uh, that we're no longer in this place of despair anymore that this book kind of presents. And it's through Christ that we that there is a purpose to all the things that we do. Um, and so I, I just am so glad that 
uh, this timed out just perfectly that I just finished Ecclesiastes. I love this book. Yeah, it's a really good one. I remember just kind of reading it uh, several years ago and kind of coming to some of the same conclusions that you did. And it's, it's a book that I think for some folks, that was probably a difficult read just because it's like, man, this is like really almost depressing in some parts, but I think for folks like you and me who, you know, who struggle with different mental illness things, it's kind of like, oh no, I totally understand where he's coming from. This kind of gives me a, a really good perspective, especially when he ends some of those long sections of, of writing with, you know, there, uh, you know, basically the, the simplicity of life is to just, you know, do your work, enjoy it and, and just enjoy your life and live it to the glory of God. And that's how you really uh, achieve that kind of, satisfaction or happiness it's not worrying about all these other things or working hard at, at something else it's just just enjoy the life that that god's given you and now that i'm sitting here thinking about it that's actually kind of um my my late grandmother's whole motto of life which is really cool uh for you to bring that up and for me to be reminded of that but as far as what i've been reading as well it's, i'm glad that you brought up mental illness and kind of tying that in with ecclesiastes because the book i've been reading and trying to finish is and the end of anxiety by josh weedman which is a book that i had gotten from a mental health i can't I remember exactly what the name of the conference was or the short little uh i don't even you really call it a conference but the short little seminar thing that the southern baptist of texas convention put on several months ago they gave us this book as a resource but also just something to kind of help us in case we are personally dealing with anxiety which i always am it seems like and so i've been working through the book and something that i like about the book is that or a few things i like about the book is that one it is heavily rooted in scripture and so every single chapter it starts off with I think three to four groups of verses to read to kind of set the tone for what Josh is going to discuss in that chapter. And then he continues to go in and elaborate on those verses and steer the way that we think about anxiety to where it's not just something that it's not like this big boogeyman or this big weight that can bring us down. It it can be if we let it, but he's trying to get you to rethink your anxiety as a tool to use, to lean on God and use it to drive you to God in prayer. And some of the quotes that he had in the book that I have highlighted here on my Goodreads, one of the things that he talks about with anxiety is that it's real and it almost always lies to you. So we've already learned anxiety doesn't have to win even when it tells you that it will. And anxiety often deals with fear. And when that drives you to anxiety, it causes you to be senseless because it really you fail to acknowledge or remember that God who cares about you is in complete control. And I know some people might balk at that and be like, well, wait a minute. No, I know that God is in control. It's like, sure. But in those moments where anxiety is taking hold of you, you're not really thinking or, or reacting or, or praying that way. And so something that I like about the book is that it's getting you to kind of think about those things and driving you to have a stronger prayer life uh, in the midst of different anxiety and things of that nature that's going on. So really good book. I'm, I've, I'm enjoying it for the most part. There was a section there that he talked about pruning that was just not worded well, in my opinion, but I'll save that for another time. And, and if anybody really wants to, to, see what that is you can go to my good reads and again the theologian on there and you can read that for yourself but that is what i have been reading now before we get into the topic of the show a quick reminder to rate and review the show on itunes or whatever podcast app that you're using because that helps us out in a long way to get boosted in the algorithm and things of that nature and helps uh, more people find the show as well plus if you leave a rating and review might just read it here on the show and might send you a gift card of the digital store of your choice. I don't know. We'll see. You'll just have to let us know uh, if you rate and review it and just send a screenshot of it to our T or G account on Twitter. But let's get into the topic of the show. Now, I kind of want to preface this with this. You know, we've talked about tabletop games on the show before. We've we've had 
uh, Clay on to talk about Godspeed. We've had Adam Hill to talk about what it takes to really build a board game and some of the different things like that. And so tabletop games are pretty popular. But here in the last few years, we've seen things like escape rooms and subscription boxes rise in popularity. And so there's a lot of different new ways to play and interact with games and get people around the table for ministry purposes, but also just general fellowship. And so these things have a massive potential to reform the way that people see and view and interact with games in some pretty unique ways. And Jeff is here to help us discuss some of those things. Now, Jeff, I kind of want to preface with this or kind of can let's let's steer the conversation this way a little bit. Because, you know, we talk about video games and how they immerse you into games and you get really invested in in the game world and the characters and kind of what's going on and the different struggles and things like that. At least if they're usually single player games or MMORPGs or RPGs in general, you know, the Skyrims and the Fallouts and Final Fantasy 14 and those kind of games. But with board games, it, it almost takes it, it. It takes that same premise, but it does it in a little bit of a different way way so man let's talk about this and and i love that you got your notes here in 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 the show notes when it comes to tabletop games escape rooms man what is it about those games and kind of what is the idea or the purpose of immersion and interacting with people in gaming (laughs) that's the the question of the hour that's a loaded question yeah so Um, yeah feel free to break it down however you see fit (laughs) I'll, i'll do the best i can um I mean, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, gaming as a, a general medium of, of how we, uh, you know, humans interact in a way um, has been around for quite some time. Um, we've always found ways to kind of uh, improve upon that, but there's some things that kind of have stayed the same. And I would argue, I mean, like, obviously, analog forms of gaming came before digital um, in a number of ways, but not to say that those the digitals are are not valuable obviously we live in a world where digital is is quite valuable right now yeah um, it's kind of the the main thing in a lot of people's <laughs> lives at this point absolutely um but i mean like i think what it what it comes comes from if you will it, it comes from a a desire to I think it kind of is twofold. And I, and I do believe that it is something that God gives us in a way, if we want to kind of go back and look at it from a, a biblical perspective here, because I mean, like this is a Christian podcast. We really want to look at what the Bible says or think about that kind of stuff. Um, I really do believe that God really wants us to, um, bel- to belong and to connect and to, uh, interact with each other in ways that are, that are meaningful and intentional in a lot of ways. Um, we're all a part of a, a big story, you know, a meta narrative of sorts of, of creation, fall, redemption. And I forget the fourth one. I am so sorry. Oh, no worries, man. Um, anyway, I always forget that. Uh, but we're, we're kind of a part of this big story, but we're all in it together in a way. And so we have to kind of find ways to, to connect and interact and communicate and that sort of thing uh, to, to live together in a sense as image bearers. And I've, I've always found that um, the gaming does a lot of that. First and foremost, if we're really talking about gaming in general, I feel like one of the things that gaming does in general is it provides a, a language of communication. Um, I'll kind of go back a little bit, uh, a little bit of preface and a little bit of history about myself that might help a little bit. Um, so many of the dear listeners know, but not all dear listeners know, um, that I actually have high functioning autism. And when I was growing up, the last thing I wanted to do was interact with anyone. I just wanted to live in my own little world, create my own little world, do what I wanted to do not really care about what anyone else was, was saying or thinking or that sort of thing. And that wasn't going to last a long time, um, if you will. But one of the ways that kind of opened me to the idea of interacting with people was gaming. Uh, when I was able to handle playing a game, which um, the first gaming that I really was introduced to 
other than console gaming, which I think was around the same time, was tabletop gaming. And, and my mom made it a point to kind of get me involved in, in, in tabletop gaming as a way to kind of be connected with other people in general. And one of the things that gaming does is it creates a, a set of ground rules, if you will, to interact. Um, it, it sets like the, the, the standard for how you do things together. So if you're playing a game, dare I say a game of, of sorry um, or that sort of thing, you know, there's standards like, you know, you roll a die and you have to move and you have to move at that number of spaces. And if you hit another player, they go back to start and that's where they, but I mean, like it seems so simple in a lot of ways, but it, it is how we interact. And of course you take that sort of thing and you evolve it into much more advanced forms of gaming. But a lot of that is, is really rudimentary in a lot of ways. Um, but it, it creates this, this language and when you get comfortable with interacting with people, you evolve to, you know, more complicated forms of interacting, if you will. Um, and so I, that kind of is kind of the, the foundation of, of a lot of this, it, it, at least in my understanding. Um, now, to, to kind of take this to a level of the, the why specifically tabletop games or really any IRL related activity that is, that is gaming related, uh, board gaming, RPGs, uh, even escape rooms, um, that sort of thing. There, there's something to doing things in person, first and foremost, is a key part of that. And second and foremost, there's a, there's a level of tactile interaction that also kind of goes into it as well um there's something about that that really makes a large difference in how you uh you interact with each other um and and so with board games i i have found that when you kind of have those pieces in front of you and those ground rules are set it, it really kind of creates this environment that's very unique and different um, and it's in a lot of ways, it can be very inviting, um, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, I, I yeah, I guess that kind of gets to what I'm really saying here. I, I feel like, yeah. And you said something interesting there about how, you know, really when it comes to, you know, tabletop games or even escape rooms, or just any, it's kind of like interactive thing. It, it immerses you because it creates this sort of language that allows you to connect with people, you know, and, and, and that to me, I, I'm going to be honest, it, it sounds super profound in the way that you, you worded that because you think about it and it's like, yeah, a lot of times when I'm playing a game, whether that's Halo or Monopoly or whatever it is, it doesn't matter what you kind of you know what kind of languages we speak or anything like that if we can understand the rules and we can work together we, we all kind of understand those parameters and we can come together and really go into a flow state or a rhythm where we're interacting and engaging one another and we're forming bonds and we're creating some interesting memories and and just being involved in getting to know the person and so that is that is really cool and and there i think there's something to be said about the the physical aspect of it being there in person you know when like i remember one time for example we would be playing like call of duty zombies or something me and adam and a few people online and someone would would take me taking down a zombie as like an offense because i took their kill so to speak and so it's because people can't see that expression on my face of like oh i didn't mean to do that i'm sorry and then like oh whatever you meant to do it you know but if you're in person, you see the person reacting. You're like, oh, they didn't mean to do that. Okay, I'm going to you know, not react like what I would if this were this were a digital experience. And I think that gives it a more – I think it gives it an advantage because you're there with the person and, and you are seeing them react to that. But let me ask you this. I, I think that is definitely a draw – to these kinds of experiences, uh, but let, let's talk about uh, escape rooms a little bit. What do you think? What do you think is the draw of those exactly? I think the the communication, the the language of the parameters, bringing people together, 
is is definitely one of those. But what else do you kind of see with people and how they interact with escape rooms? Because you work at a company that does escape rooms. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, uh, in uh, late August, beginning of September, uh, I will have been a game master at an escape room facility. Um, and uh, I actually kind of got into escape rooms. It's a, the interesting story about that is, side note, um, when I was um, kind of looking for jobs, the opportunity presented itself. And I got some advice uh, to uh, add to my resume. Um, I actually, previous to that, and actually continuing on pre-COVID, um, and actually now it's kind of going back into a thing, which is really cool. I was actively involved in hosting a regular tabletop meetup in my local area. Um, and I actually got advice to add that to my resume uh, because what that did, and this is something that my boss was really happy to see because she kind of understood that I uh, understood the language of gaming in general, which is a big part of why um, the entertainment value of an escape room is it is a collaborative, cooperative game that you're working on together. It is a collaborative, co cooperative puzzle. And so I was hired partly because of that reason, um, mostly because of that reason. And so um, escape rooms themselves, uh, I guess I don't know. I'm assuming that people know what they are, but I'll kind of you know. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to say, I mean, because I'm, I'm just thinking because I just found out about escape rooms, I think. In 2019, even like roughly what they were, and and I think that these are this is still such a early industry, at least here in the states, that I think it'd probably be beneficial for people listening to this show to maybe even just give them a primer, or a brief history yeah. of kind of what these what these things are, how they work, and yeah. those kind of things. Absolutely. Um, so, um, escape rooms essentially are immersive puzzles. Um, you're and it's a group collaborative team effort. Uh, the traditional understanding of an escape room is that you're locked in a room and you basically have to use the elements in the room, clues, props, uh, what have you to open locks. Usually traditionally they're combination locks. Sometimes you have to interact with some sort of electronic. Uh, many times you have to interact with things in unconventional ways. And you basically try to progress through the room to eventually unlock the door that you were locked in to escape hence escape rooms now uh the interesting thing is is that that kind of traditional idea has kind of gone away but i'll get back to that in a moment interestingly enough the history of escape rooms is is in reverse and the reason i say that is because there was a uh there's some popular computer games one of them called mist that existed mm. And so uh, <laughs> I can just hear our editor right now getting real giddy. That's one of his favorite games uh, uh, of all time. Yep. So Mist is a point and click adventure uh, where you're interacting and solving puzzles in that sort of way. Now, one of the origins of escape rooms, there's kind of two fundamental origins where they come from. The first is Japan. Uh, they obviously, you know, it's a kind of a thing that they enjoy or that was part of the culture that they, they enjoy very logic based and, and math types of puzzles and that sort of thing. And so, you know, they like to kind of solve those really intricate types of puzzles and, um, and everything like that. And those are wonder. They're great puzzles and they're integrated in many ways in, in escape rooms. Um, and they're very rudimentary in terms of the logic, but that was a really important foundation in the, in another part of the world, specifically in a place called Budap in, in Budapest in Hungary. There was a guy, I forget his name. It's a long Hungarian name. I don't know if I can pronounce it. I will not. <laughs> Pro probably um, better not to even attempt it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to bother. But anyway, so he played Mist. He played a lot of these point and click computer games. And he also worked as a social worker. And he did a lot of things with team building activities. Huh. And he had this brilliant idea of saying, what if I took the, the puzzly point and click aspect of these digital games that I play and put them into an analog space, hence the escape room. So that's kind of where 
that comes from. And so the first escape room uh, in this kind of from the school of thought, if you will, is a room. It's called Para Park. I have no idea if it still exists, but when that started, there was a explosion of escape rooms that started. There are so many escape room facilities in, in Budapest, Hungary. Um, and then it kind of spread and then it just kind of came over here to the United States. And now that's why it's a thing. And it's probably why within your area, I'm going to assume there's probably an escape room within driving distance, except if you like live in the middle of no, nowhere. But then again, that's a whole other problem in and of itself. Um, I, I actually live in the middle of nowhere and I can tell you there's at least two escape room facilities uh, that are within driving distance. of. Well, I should say driving distance in relation to being a Texan, it's within an hour of, of, of right. the driving distance of where I'm at. So right. yeah, there's, Absolutely. there's definitely some nearby. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so they, they are, they're like a bunch of different like elements and things like that. Some interactive, like, you know, things you unlock, but yeah, that's, that's where it all started. Um, and as a matter of fact, I've actually done, I actually haven't been to Hungary. I've never been out of this country, uh, the United States, but I've actually done some escape rooms in Hungary virtually oh, wow. uh, before. Yeah. And so you really see like the origins of these escape rooms and like things that they did to kind of make them work. They're very combination lock heavy. Uh, because they didn't really have a lot of electronics to kind of make things work, and they had to be very, very analog. Uh, but it still works. It's still a compelling puzzle to do. And there are a lot of ways you can really add, you know, different types of interactive elements that you can put together and puzzles and things like that or what have you, um, visuals you can put around the room to to solve uh, these puzzles and things like that. And so I've done a few of them, and they're actually pretty good. Um, obviously, you know, with the, uh, intersection of kind of like, you know, creating like a Disney world kind of experience where things are a lot more interactive. Um, and there's also been kind of an evolution away from combination locks, um, and, and more of a electrical automated sort of thing. You kind of interact with different switches and, and that sort of thing. And so, um, that's really kind of where escape rooms are now. And they keep on going, they keep on innovating in a, in a lot of these, these directions that um, are really cool. Um, so uh, my first escape room actually, and it was, it was kind of interesting because I didn't realize it was necessarily an escape room until after the fact I did an escape room in Boston uh, back in 2006 uh, when I was at a uh, choir competition uh, that we all did together. And it was a place called Five Wits, which is one of the first ones that kind of came out in the in North America, in the United States. Um, and they had different ideas of how an escape room was, and then they kind of, you know, evolved into what they are now. Um, but anyway, uh, so escape rooms in general are um, just, they're, they're, they serve a lot of purposes, in a lot of ways, they're just an entertaining activity in general. There's yeah. nothing more fun to be locked uh, well, working together or as in the case, I'll kind of, you know, kind of mention some of the themes that, or at least one of the themes uh, I have. A, there's a theme at one of my job at my job. Uh, the room is uh, area 51. Oh, and okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and the premise of the room basically is that you, um, uh, a city has been destroyed by an alien ship. And you've been sent to Area 51 to utilize the technology that is there uh, to destroy the alien ship. And so there's this like when you go in the room, there's this like uh, shut down alien like UFO in the room. And so you essentially have to try to activate all the technology in the room uh, to destroy it. So you're so the thing that keeps you in the room now is is not being locked in the room, but solving a problem. Huh. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. That's so fascinating to me. Like when I first heard about escape rooms and kind of saw just some of the ones that are in my area, it was just kind of this whole idea of, you know, you're locked in a room, you got to figure out a puzzle to get out. And then that's it. Like a literal, like a, a most literal form of what an escape room would be. But that, you bringing that up and then in combination to some of the tweets that I saw, because I tweeted out 
uh, to some of our listeners on Twitter, you know, have you, have you done an escape room? What have been your experiences? And some of the ones that they were telling us about was there was one that was even kind of like a, a, a not Harry Potter theme, but Harry Potter themed one <laughs> that was kind of like that. <laughs> and so that's just, that's so fascinating that, that they're, they're not just this, you get locked in a room, you got to escape. It's like, no, they're like, there's some creativity to some of these, like the area 51 that you're describing now. And I didn't mean to interrupt it. It just, it, it kind of blows yeah. my mind a little bit at how eclectic or diverse the escape rooms are. And it's not just escape a room. It's, you know, no, there's some objectives you can do and, and things of that nature. That's really cool. Now it's, it's interesting because a little bit of insider baseball, if you will, there's actually a secondary reason why that's become a new thing. And it actually has to do with safety. Um, it's actually in, in, I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's actually a state law that we can't actually lock people in the room because of fire oh, safety. Yeah. 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 So as a matter of fact, uh, I think like a year or so ago, there was a, there was an incident, I think in Poland, uh, where there was a, there was some people who died doing an escape room or trying to do an escape room. They obviously really, yeah, because I think there was either some sort of fire or something and because they locked them in the room. Oh, they couldn't get out. Yeah. So basically what we've had to do as, as you know, in the world of escape rooms we've had, and, and I think it actually solves multiple problems really, because you don't really need to lock people in a room to immerse them in something. You know, there's other ways to keep a captive audience, if you will, as is in the example of what Area 51 is, you know, um, and so it solved that problem. That's kind of one of the secondary explanations. But I think it is it, it knocks two birds, uh, mocks multiple birds of one stone, if you will. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, that's the whole reason. And actually, whenever we uh, introduce groups in, we always make it clear to them that their door is not actually locked. They can get in and out at any time. Um, and that's just for their safety and convenience and that sort of thing. Um, and of course we remind them, you know, getting out of the room is not necessarily solving it. The problem will actually keep you captive in there. And so, um, that's why they've been successful really is kind of like overcoming that hurdle by solving multiple problems at the same time yeah, um, and everything like that. And so, uh, that's kind of really what's been the new thing. As a matter of fact, my job right now, we're building a, a room that has no combination locks at all. Uh, everything is done electronically. Huh. Uh, yeah, it's it's been really fun to do that. Um, my, it's, I, it's yeah. like you get, you're like helping – craft this experience yes i'm designing oh, that's the really puzzle. cool yeah yeah i'm designing the puzzles uh so cool thing about the the job i work for um it's a husband and wife team who started this business five years ago actually uh they just celebrated their five-year anniversary and it's a um and the husband is an, an engineer he's uh and i think he worked for a car uh uh, place or something like that and then he kind of got into this and see he single-handedly builds and maintains these rooms oh wow and he just like when i've actually seen him build a room like the process and it's just crazy but he gets it done and it, and it's so cool what he's what he thinks about and creates and so when we have these like meetings about what we want to do for puzzles you know he we don't really, he doesn't really care necessarily how crazy the idea is. He will figure out a way to make it work. Oh, and that's awesome. It's so cool. Uh, so I've come up with a few, with a good portion of the puzzles and actually I'm a part of play testing them as well. Um, but that's kind of, you know, a little bit of an angle off of there, but, but anyway, um, so that's kind of what we, we do. And so um, the way that it really works when you do an escape room, by the way, usually is so you'll be put in the room it's usually an hour-long experience um there may or may not be a secret room uh may or may not <laughs> can't really confirm it necessarily <laughs> right we don't want to give we don't want to give away all the no, secrets no, you know that's funny because i i just put out a uh i work with do the social media for my job and uh I my job actually enjoys me looking up the latest memes and making them. It's, <laughs> awesome. It's, 
<laughs> so uh you know that one with um uh Anakin and Oh and Padme? Yeah, and Padme. Yes. So the meme, I'll kind of read it out to you, is basically uh, so Anakin, it says, solved all the puzzles in the room. And then Padme is like, we escaped the room. And then he gives a blank stare and he's like, <laughs> we escaped the room. <laughs> and, the secret, and then the secret door opens. That's and awesome. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me when I watch, when I run a room. Like the, the, I get pleasure out of people freaking out. Sometimes they even like fall to the floor. Like what? This room came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So basically as a game master, we get the room and the group into the room and then we sit in the control room and we watch them. Uh, it gets a little, little interesting because it's kind of like a psychological experiment in a way you kind of notice patterns of how, how groups work. Yeah. Um, and you notice things and that kind of helps me to do my job because then I know how to help them because we also, thankfully, we don't leave them completely without any help. We give them clues. Um, and so we like kind of look at the progress that they've done, how far along they've gone in particular puzzles. And then we give them applicable clues to help them out if they need the help and, and everything like that. And so that's really kind of the, the function. And then, of course, the, the glorified part of my job is that I do cleaning as in resetting. So I have to reset the room completely back after a group is done. Uh, put all the electrical elements back, put all the clues back where they need to go, uh, test the room electronically, make sure it all works, and then do it all over again. That's really and, cool. Uh, yeah, it, it's fun. So, so with with these escape rooms, like, are, are there different levels of, like, difficulty or challenges? Like, yeah. I, I guess, like, for some of our listeners who probably are listening to this, like, I wouldn't mind trying that out, especially if they're in the Pennsylvania um, area. You know, like, what would you – like, are there, are there beginner level ones or are they all kind of the same or what is the difficulty like with these? So there, there's kind of a few ways to, to explain it. Um and it kind of gets into how sometimes the room is designed as well. Um, we do have uh, the rooms we have are all kind of at the same level, but they kind of have categories of, of puzzles. So, um, but essentially the other thing that might get into the difficulty of a room is kind of the, the linearity of the room itself. So, some rooms are linear and some rooms are nonlinear and some of them are like a mishmash combination of two. Uh, so a little bit of insider information. Area 51 is linear pretty much in the beginning. So you solve one puzzle and then you solve the next puzzle and then you solve the next puzzle and then you solve the next puzzle. So it's kind of like you go from step one to step two to step right, three. Right, it's not right. like all over the place. It's not all over the place. Whereas a nonlinear room, there may be multiple puzzles you need to do in that room. And okay. then you, and you don't really necessarily know where to start. There's no clear indicator as to where to start. Um, and you just kind of have to pick everything up and figure out, if something goes together, um, they usually will come together for one puzzle, but you have to solve all of them to be able to get to the next step. Um, and so there are certain rooms that like, you know, will also have really challenging puzzles. Um, some of them will, many rooms don't include uh, knowing any sort of outside knowledge other than like, you know, arithmetic, um, you know, things like that like with, with the area 51 you don't really have to know like military inside information or anything like that and if there's any information you really need to know we provide that for you so that you really are just using your brain and putting information together um but there are certain rooms that like they just you know really assume that you're like a master of those types of things and they don't give you a lot of information you really have to kind of go with with nothing um I, I can't really say that I've done a lot of challenging rooms per se myself, because I've actually played rooms. Of course, it's a kind of a thing I enjoy doing. Um, but it, it kind of is hard to say. There's times where they like, you know, assume that, you know, uh, there's, there's a certain kind of like um, way that you decipher letters. Uh, that's like pig. There's something called pig pen that it like, you basically use a grid of letters. It, it's complicated to explain. Okay. Um, but you know, uh, there's actually, it, it's, it's so serious of a thing. There's actually a worldwide escape room championship. 
Really? Uh, it's sponsored by Red Bull, believe it or not. No, uh, really? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. See, and man, uh, this is such this is such a new world to me that I yeah. I had no idea that these were so prevalent that like Red Bull has a thing that they sponsor. Yeah, there's a championship. Actually, yeah, there's a there's a professor uh, at a at a university in Canada. I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Scott Richardson. Uh, he's like one of the originators. So he actually is a professor in the world of, of gaming in general, uh, really huh. more along the lines of analog gaming, but also escape rooms as well, because a lot of those kind of intersect. And so at his actual classroom, he has like a game lab and he has like a wall of board games. Uh, the, the meme is, is that he used to host like a, one of the original content creation arms of, of tabletop gaming called board gaming with Scott. Uh, and that sort of thing. And so, but he actually is the one who designs, uh, the, the, was one of the key people who designs the, the world championship escape room every year. Um, and, uh, I will actually, uh, mention there's a good, uh, video by, uh, Mark Rober who talks about the fundamentals of solving an escape room. And he consults with Scott, uh, Richardson on these as well. Um, I'm going to, uh, add that to the show notes so you can kind of learn some insider information. And I can yeah, tell you yeah. for a fact that these tips do work. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a group like fail because they don't get these things right. Um, you know, and so, uh, but yeah, that that's really the world of it all. And, and, and there's just so much out there not to mention of course kind of getting into some other topics there are actually board game versions of escape rooms that are out there as well really uh, yes um like, they, sorry yeah th this is just my dumb brain going so like this is probably not what it is but like is it like you're i, I don't even want to say it because it sounds that stupid now that i'm thinking about it but is it like putting you in a room like you but you you pay for the the thing and then it, you put yourself in a room and you unlock things or what does that look like it's probably not what i'm thinking it is but it's like but like what what does that look like well so when it comes to a board game there's there's limitations for how you create it especially if you're trying to like create a very pared down version um the most fundamental version of them is basically just cards um, oh, okay. so yeah, so there's a well-known one. I actually have almost all of them. Uh, it's a unlock It's published by space cowboys. Um, and what it is, is it's a stack of tarot sized cards, if you will, uh, taller cards. Um, and basically the cards are all numbered and lettered. And then you also do use an app. So it's not completely analog. And okay. the app is a way for you to do the timer, for you to enter in codes, for you to operate certain machines. But there's some cardinal rules that you learn, such as red numbers and blue numbers add up together. And when you add them, the number that you get is a card you need to pull from the stack. Um, and so it's a, it's a whole system. Uh, that you learn. And then they kind of have evolved a whole bunch from that original system. They've been doing these for a few years now. And now the, the games that they have, actually, they come in a pack of three, usually. And it's an easy one, and a medium one, and a hard one. Uh, there's some ongoing series that they have. There's a clown scientist villain uh, named Dr. No Side who shows up. But they delve into like classic literature like The Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland and that sort of thing. And there's, they, they have a whole bunch of them out there. There's other ones that are out there too. There's escape tales. Uh, there's deckscape. There's, um, exit, which is more of a, Oh, and, and by the way, when you play these unlocks, when you finish them, uh, they can be used by someone else. So obviously when you do an escape room, you, you know, all the answers, uh, but you can just hand off the game to somebody else. And you know, it still works just as well. Um, some of them, you actually have to cut things up so you can't really like hand it off to someone else to do it again. Exit mm -hmm. is, is one of the examples of that. Uh, okay. That when you're cutting things up, writing on things, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so it adds another level of immersion, dare I say, uh, to the game. Sometimes they even come with very unusual props and things like that. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of how they've translated a lot of that into uh, a board game form. 
uh, that Ooh. is out there. Yeah, so they're really cool, and they're also rather inexpensive too. Okay, um, I want to say like a three pack is probably around the price of an escape room ticket itself, maybe even a little less. Okay. Uh, so a little piece of advice for the dear listeners. If you want to kind of get an idea of how an escape room works, this is actually a good way to kind of get used to that. Um, okay. Get a, get a group together, get an escape room board game, you know, um, play one together and kind of get some fundamentals down about how they potentially work. And then that's a good primer for you to then get to the next level of doing an actual escape room. Wow, that's cool. I think that'd be a really good thing for even just like a, a student ministry or college group to do because that would just be kind of cool to yes. to just come together to do that yep. that sort of thing. That's really yep. cool. Yes. Well, Jeff, I know um, you know, kind of want to be mindful of time and you know, there's one other thing I kind of want to get into that we kind of mentioned a little bit briefly. I want to make sure we have enough time to discuss that. So we're going to switch over to this one specific thing that I'm going to bring up. But dear listeners, as always, if you have any questions or want to talk about this particular thing more hit us up on social media or if you know jeff on the in the discord server feel free to hit him up as well and kind of go from there but one of the things that i wanted to to definitely talk about on this podcast is something that my wife is really into she's really into true crime and makeup and she found this youtuber called bailey sarian i think is what her name is where every monday she puts out a video where she does makeup and she talks about a true crime thing but something that she mentioned in one of her videos was that she was sponsored by i can't remember the name of the company but it's like a subscription box where you get this this box of items and it's like a game that you try to figure out who like who done it you know it's like clue but on steroids you know so so you get these subscription boxes and man and i know you you work with that uh you guys are kind of working on some of that getting that out to to people and and what is i guess from your perspective what has it been like to see or to get into these kinds of of gaming where it's a subscription box and you're trying to figure out who done it and what what has that been like and have you guys seen what have you guys seen in terms of like popularity or demand or things like that? So, um, interestingly enough, we kind of got into this, this business of, of creating a murder mystery subscription box. Um, if you will. Um, and it came out of a, uh, trying to find a solution. So, uh, escape rooms were one of the main targets or targets, but at least one of the, the main, uh, entities affected by COVID uh, because it was an entertainment venue that was in person. And so many of them obviously had to close down in light of COVID. Um, and my boss being the kind of the, the problem solver that he is, the, the two of them, the husband and wife, um, they decided that it would be a good opportunity uh, to try something a little different and use their expertise in escape rooms and puzzle making and they just so happened to do another one that's a uh, hunter killer is the one that they did. And they kind of were like, you know, maybe we can make something like this. And so they approached a, a bunch of us and asked, would anyone be interested in working a little bit and doing something like this? And so that's where capture the killer, which is the one that I do uh, was born. Um, and so what we had to really do is learn quite a bit there's a few things when, when you make a murder mystery or subscription box or that sort of thing that don't exactly translate from an escape room um, in, in, in that sort of thing. And so there are puzzles in the box and basically you solve those puzzles and then using those puzzles, you, you the answers, you get information about a murder mystery that you're ultimately trying to solve. And the subscription aspect of it is, is that you get a box a month. Uh, that gives you um, five or six or so puzzles in it and maybe one or two props. And then you essentially take all of that together, get a group of people together. It takes like maybe two and a half, three hours or so uh, to solve them. And then you uh, also have a website that you work with, uh, which is usually the case with all these murder mystery subscription boxes. That is the way they enter answers, uh, maybe even get hints and that sort of thing. And so uh, that's – it came it, – it, uh, our involvement in it came out of a – desiring a solution for those who want to continue to do escape rooms or puzzles but are 
or at the time currently or still kind of are limited um, in their ability to kind of go back and, and interact in society uh, or just in general, they're kind of stuck at home or whatever. They just want to get a group of people together to do this. Um, that's yeah, kind that's, of the, the that's problem really smart. that we solved. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it was definitely a bit of a learning process for us, but we have successfully finished um, our first series. Right now we're actually working on our next one. And uh, But it's been really interesting. Um, there's a lot – of things that you can do that, that you can't do in escape rooms and, and vice versa mm -hmm. um, that we've, we've had to learn. But nonetheless, I, I've really enjoyed the process. Um, I, I'm not as much of a store because you do have to craft a story. That's the other right. thing is that there, right. there is a narrative that you have to immerse people into to get them connected to the murder and get them invested in wanting to solve it and gather all the information. Uh, you have to kind of do that uh, so that you give that immersion that's kind of like being in a, in a physical escape room in a sense because the escape room itself – gives the immersion just by being in the room but when you're at home and the surrounding doesn't match what is happening in the story you have to figure out other ways to immerse and mm -hmm. so that's kind of what we've had to learn uh but there's a lot of things that kind of translate directly over uh, that that i've found so um that's that's really what what that world looks like and, and there's a lot of similarities to escape room board games as well it's just that there's a bit more you can do because usually with these types of things you can like rip them up right on them, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. that's what, again, this whole, anytime I'll just <laughs> getting tongue tied. Now the, when we started this podcast and people started telling us about tabletop games and we start going into it more and I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that. It's not really my thing. But as I've noticed with this show and really because of this show, the more that I've gone down the rabbit hole of tabletop games and now eventually arriving at escape rooms and murder mystery subscription boxes and things like that, I'm like, it's so cool at how gaming is, is changing and evolving right before our very eyes. And it's just like that. You guys encountered a, a, a situation that COVID brought up to where, you know, people weren't coming into escape rooms and you guys innovated and got around that and essentially reformed the whole the way that you guys do the the gaming that you do there that you provide for people. And I think that is just so cool that y'all ran into a situation, but you found a solution and it's just continuing to provide some new opportunities for not only yourselves, but for us who – you know, maybe maybe we were tired of playing some some video games and we want to try something else. And so we try to get into tabletop games and that leads us down this road. It's it's so cool how, you know, this kind of thing is just coming to be. And I guess would you say from your experience with doing escape rooms and, and tabletop games and now murder mystery subscription boxes – do you think that this is a little more accessible to the general audience, whereas something like video games may not be? Yeah, I, I would definitely say so. Um, I think that when, when you're trying to be like, I, I real I recognize that, you know, there is a, that digital games do and have really evolved on immersion, just VR in general, which I've done that trips me out. Like, well, yeah. Let me tell you, it's, it's I did a mess first, depending on what you do. It tripped me. I brought my friend brought one over, and I'm like, uh, "This is too much for me." Okay, I, I love immersion. It's too much. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, more power to those who enjoy it. It's a great thing. It's wonderful. It's just not for not for me. Um, but uh, but but I think the one thing about uh, the the approachability is that. It's not a digital thing. It's a physical it, – like it gets really interesting. Um, as we – as a culture – and I really also kind of think this is a bit of a commentary on, on our society right now. Um, so COVID, everything became digital. The way we interacted with each other, yeah. we – you know. Uh, all of us were on Zoom for our meetings. We were meeting in person. Many of us experienced church that way, uh, you know, watching the live stream and interacting that way and that sort of thing. 
And I, I recognize that it did solve a problem for the time being, but we're created to do things physically in a, in, and board games provide that in spades. Um, there, there's just something really, uh, and also escape room games, murder mystery, all these interactive in-person games provide something that is still necessary in how we interact. Um, there's just something to going into a room with people facing each other, discussing the clues that you have in your hand and, and the, 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 the utter euphoria that you have when you solve the room. Like I can't tell you how many times I've loved the enthusiasm that I get when, when a group solves the room, uh, especially if they, one, if they've never done escape rooms before and this is their first time. And, and two, when they're just at the end of that hour and they just manage to squeeze out a, a win, I can't tell you how exciting that is. And that's just because they're doing it together. And, 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 and there's a real aspect to that that I think we need and we still need as, as humans, as, as image bearers, that we, we still need to do these things together. And so I feel like that really is what it comes down to more than anything. And, um, and, I, and I really hope and pray that people will recognize that. And I think they are. I think that this pandemic has really woken up people to the reality that there is something still valuable about disconnecting from technology and just doing things together in person. There's just something to that. And I mean, like, obviously, the great thing is, is that you can still do console games together in person. You can still have your buddies over, uh, lose friendships really quickly over a game of Mario Kart or Mario Party. If you <laughs> yeah. Will. You know, and that's still a valuable thing, but you're facing a screen. You're not facing each other in, in many ways. And there's just something about seeing the people you're playing with in person that is so fundamentally different. Um, that is, is why board games are so popular. It's why um, escape rooms are so popular. It's why murder mystery subscription boxes or subscription boxes of puzzle boxes in general are, are growing in popularity and really picked up during the pandemic especially because there's just something to it that's so different. Um, and, and, that, and we've learned that and I'm so glad that people still value that. And that's why we're, we're still in business, but really I'm, I'm, even if it, even if I didn't really necessarily get paid to do this, I, I would still love to do it. So, yeah, definitely. Well, that's really cool. And I think we've kind of come full circle a little bit in, you know, how, you know, we, we talked about how there's a difference between doing something in the digital space versus in the physical space. And I think you're right. I think COVID has woken a lot of people up to that. I know when we were, uh, digital for a while as a church and talking to students, they were all ready to go back to school and be in person and be with their friends because they hated anything that had a screen on it at that point. And they're like, we want to, we want to be together. Like we want to be with our friends. We want to be with our teachers. We want to actually be in a classroom. We don't want to be on zoom. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that just goes to show and really points to how, you know, we're created beings to we're social creatures, you know, that's how God created us to be together, to be with people, to, you know, be there physically with one another. And sure, the digital stuff, it does a good job of being a supplement at times, but at the end of the day, you know, we're created to be social being social creatures, to work together, to live together, to communicate with one another. And I think, this is something that that allows us to really fulfill that and achieve that and at the same time build relationships with some people but jeff man i want to thank you for coming on to the show and man if, i mean if you're comfortable with it feel free to give a shout out to the the escape room company that you work for and maybe some of our listeners who are in pennsylvania will will come check it out yeah uh and I should clarify because Pennsylvania is a pretty big state and definitely not as big as right. Texas, but it is a big state. Uh, the running joke with me is whenever people tell me they're from Pennsylvania, the first question I ask is which part? 
because a <laughs> lot of them are usually on the west side of the state or in the the hicks and in the, in the central side of the state i'm closer to philadelphia um so uh the one i work for uh i work for escape room mystery which is located in uh, King of Prussia, which is right by one of the biggest malls in the, the entire United States. It's a pretty big mall. It's been there for quite some time. Uh, we are actually one of four escape room companies in King of Prussia alone. Uh, wow. So we got okay. a lot of competition. Um, but we've been going strong and, and loving it, and uh, it's, it's been great. We actually own another location in Cherry Hill, New Jersey as well, which is equidistant from Philly, uh, but it's in New Jersey for those who are in that area. Um, and uh, so uh, the four rooms that we have, um, the first one I mentioned, Area 51, we have uh, the Egyptian Tomb, uh, Revolution Spies, and the Billionaire's Den, at our King of Prussia location, Revolution Spies, because right next to King of Prussia is the Valley Forge National Park, which uh, if you know your uh, American history, that was one of the key areas in, in the uh, Revolutionary War. Um, so we kind of capitalized on that. Uh, it's why Philly has a lot of, you know, Revolutionary War, like, you know, the 76ers, if you will, um, that's kind of all comes from the fact that, you know, Philadelphia was a very key part of the uh, Revolutionary War. And then in Cherry Hill, we also have the laboratory as well. Um, we're located, you know, you can pretty much just look it up uh, us up on escaperymystery.com. Um, make sure you specifically look up Escape Room Mystery. Uh, it's kind of a key thing in, in searching, but you'll you'll find us. We'll, I'll include it in the show notes and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that that's where I work, um, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you wanted me to talk about Capture the Killer. I guess I can talk about that too. Yeah, yeah. If you want to let dear listeners know about that, because I'm sure there's some of our listeners who are into true crime stories or maybe their, their their spouses are, you know, feel free to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So so Capture the Killer, uh, CaptureTheKiller.com. Uh, we, uh, the first series that we launched is, is called Evidence of Malice, and it takes place in 1920s, Rural George, rural uh, words are hard. Rural <laughs> Georgia at a county fair. Uh, the premise of Capture the Killer is that you uh, get involved in this library and you meet up with uh, an, a librarian named Astrid, who's a part of a organization called the Syncopaths. And essentially, what you're doing is you're going back in history and you're basically correcting history in a sense. So. Obviously, history happened a particular way. They believe at that time they believed that one person was the murderer, and you are basically trying to figure out who the actual murderer is. And so, you get all sorts of different documents and things like that that kind of help you put all that together. So, CaptureTheKiller.com is a website. We actually are currently running a promotion right now. Uh, that if you get your first box, you can get it for free. Uh, not for free. Oh, boy. Not for free. Oh, whoa. <laughs> uh, I was about to say, not for free. You get it 50% off. Um, and if you use code, oh, boy. I had it in my head. I am so sorry. If you use code DEAR50, that code again is DEAR50, D-E-E-R-5-0. Uh, all capital letters, all the same word. Uh, when you check out, you'll be able to get your first box 50% off. There's no commitment necessary to be able to do that. So if you get the first box and you get that 50% off and you absolutely hate it, you don't need to get it anymore. But if you love it, you can continue subscribing at regular price if you want to. Um, and then if you also get the six-month subscription, that 50% off will take be taken off one of the boxes for the total price if you want to do the full six months. Um, so that is a promotion that we are currently running. Um, and uh, you can just go and capture the killer and you'll be able to subscribe. Uh, cool fun fact, uh, it's kind of a part of me being on this episode. Uh, we are actually going to be giving a six-month subscription to dear Logan here uh, for he and his wife to play. Uh, so he'll be getting that very soon and uh, reviewing that on the YouTube channel. So take a look for that and see uh, if it's something that interests you, if you want to get that uh, and pick it up yourself. We are currently, by the way, only delivering to the 48 
contiguous states in the United States right now. Uh, so sorry, Alaska and Hawaii and to our Canadian dear listeners. Um, <laughs> but right now we're, we're just, we just started this. So, right. uh, but if things get better, you never know. It could be a possibility that we can yeah. broaden who we deliver to and that sort of thing. But for the time being, just the 48 contiguous states. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, super excited to, to be able to do that and, and make a YouTube video kind of showcasing this uh this game capture the killer i kind of knew about this before we recorded dear listeners but it's cool to announce it here on the show that you guys are gonna see some more content based around that on our youtube channel so again youtube.com slash the reform gamers and hit the bell icon after you subscribe so that way you get notified of new uploads and you won't miss out uh, when we get that put together i know my wife is super excited and i am as well because it's just it's a new gaming experience for me you know <laughs> this is the cool thing about this show is it got me into tabletop gaming and uh and in the same way it's probably gonna get me into escape rooms and and murder mystery boxes after this who knows you know so it'll be it'll be a lot of fun but yeah well before we end the show there's a few things we got to do here uh, so with this being our second episode of the month this is our patron thank you episode thank you. This is where we thank our uh, patrons who support us over on Patreon.com, whether you're at the dollar tier or above. I just want to shout you out and thank you for your continued support for the month of July and allowing us to continue to do what we do here at the show and upgrading our Zencaster so we have fun little sound um, sound effects like this. You know, oh, we, get to, we get to do little fun things like that. <laughs> <laughs> And so we'll be working on those uh, in the in between this episode and the next episode, and we'll be doing different uh, sound effects as well and transition sounds as well. So it's it's cool. Just want to thank you all for your continued support over there. That allows us to do that. Uh, and those people are Aaron L. White, Alex Casalanos, Andre Swan, Ashley Cronenbitter, Chris Freeman, Christopher Commander, Daryl Tavares, David Henderson, David Matthews, Derek Smith, Isaac Dot Stoltz, Jake Walker, Jeff Jackson Jr. What? <laughs> That's you, Jimmy Chonga, Joanne Monroe, Josh Broccolo, Kokorodaki, Luke Strain, Mark Fromey, Matt Edwards, Matthew White Chocolate McDougal, Matt Millsap, Melvin Benson V, Micah Hendrick, Michael Toller, Mr. Buds, Nate McKeever, Peter Piper, Retro Rewind Podcast, Ryan 1701E, Sam White, Savone Pena, Third Strongest Mall, Travis, Weatherman Keith, Wesley Ray, and Xavier Medina. Y'all, thank you for supporting us over on Patreon.com. Com. It allows us to continue doing what we do here on the show. And again, that's patreon.com slash the reform gamers. You can consider lending support to the show over there and allows you to get our shows early and uncut. So all the goofs and all of the stuff that Skinner edits out, you hear every single one. If you are a Patreon supporter and you get behind the scenes posts, uh, an extra episode of the show each month as well. And so you get all sorts of fun stuff over there on Patreon. But before we let you go, before we end the show again, one more thing we got to do is some reco, some things to check out. Jeff, what are some things our dear listeners need to check out? If you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. Yeah, so uh, as a uh, fundamental starter, God Mode Activated, really. Uh, so uh, that's uh, GodModeActivated.com is uh, the ministry website. Check us out. We have a Discord. We're also active on Twitch, twitch.com slash I believe it is GMA Ministries. Uh, we do a few shows on there, like Pastors After Dark, uh, Agree to Disagree, that sort of thing. Great stuff. Discord community, the most okayest people ever. Uh, I I make sure that that's the case. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's one recommendation. Another. Uh, so one of the main ways that I play board games, especially with people online, because, you know, time and space is a bit of a limitation, is BoardGameArena.com. Uh, so with BoardGameArena, it is a um, – you sign up and it's free, and there are many games that you can get that are free that you can play, and it's a very 2D environment. Uh, there's a lot of mouse over effects and a lot of the popular games are on there. Some you might not have heard of, but you know, if you ever want to like try them out, they're really easy to pick up and they give you a lot of help with learning a game and that sort of thing. And then they do have a premium level. Uh, I know that it's like 25 bucks a year to get a premium subscription to them and you get access to all their games. One and two, if you're a premium subscriber, you also can add any of the free account holders to your games that you host 
and you can play practically anything. Uh, I host regular tabletop gaming on uh, the Gone Mode Activated as a community event. So if you want to try out some board games and also get taught by yours truly, there's a game you probably haven't heard of before, uh, check that out. That's my recommendation. Right on. And then, of course, you know, Capture the Killer and all that stuff. Again, links to literally everything we've talked about will be in your show notes. So be sure to check all of that out and uh, and click on those things and check them out and, and kind of, you know, be sure to use that code as well for your 50% off on Capture the Killer if you are interested in trying that out. As far as my recos go, uh, yeah, when it comes to the show, man, y'all – Retweet, retweet. I can't say the word. Words, Words are hard. Words are hard. Retweet our stuff on social media. If you guys, if we drop a new episode or, you know, we tweet something out that you really like, retweet that, interact with it. We'd love to connect and engage with y'all and also, you know, connect with some of uh, some of the like minded gamers or even just some gamers in general. Uh, review the show on iTunes, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, would really love to just have those connections, but also that support there because uh, we get asked all the time, you know, what are some ways we can support the show? And as much as we would love to, to have financial support, uh, we know a lot of people can't do that. So the best way you can really support us is by retweeting our stuff, sharing it on Facebook, reviewing the show on iTunes, liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel and, and commenting on, on new videos and things of that nature. Uh, that that's my reco, you know, do not knock that out of the park. Let's, uh, let's connect. Let's talk about some video games on those different platforms. And let's see if we can spread the word about TRG. The other reco I'm going to share as well is, you know, I've been getting into lawn care recently. I've been tweeting a lot about lawn care and tackling the weeds in my backyard and, and mowing and learning what it, what it, it all does. Like, I can't, I still can't talk. This is a good time. It's a good thing we're at the end of the show. Cause if this happened earlier, whoo, but one of the things I've been doing, one of the things I really like about lawn care is that it gives me an opportunity to get caught up on podcasts. And one of the things that I've been doing is looking for, new podcast. And I found this one that is being produced by Christianity Today, talking about the rise and fall of Mars Hill Church and getting into Mark Driscoll stuff and some of the other things that were going on at the church. And it's been pretty fascinating uh, to listen to. Then again, or I guess I should make this disclaimer, you know, kind of take what you hear with a grain of salt as I've been talking to some of our dear listeners about the show and kind of getting their feedback with some people who have actually, who were actually there at the church while this was actually all going on. Like, yeah, they're presenting some of the stuff a little differently. And it seems like some of the stuff has a little bit of a, of a little bit of a bias in one direction. And so take what you hear with a grain of salt, but at the same time, it's, it's a pretty fascinating thing to listen to. So rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast by Christianity today is another thing I would recommend, but Jeff, thank you again for coming on the show, man, taking out or carving out some time uh, to discuss these different things uh, with the dear listeners and hopefully introduce them to a new way that they can try out some gaming with their friends, family, and uh, even their church group as well. My pleasure. I'm glad to be on the show. Thanks so much, Logan. Yeah, man. And a great part of the community too. You guys will know Jeff if you hang out in the Discord. You guys have probably seen him several times. He's a great encourager. But a few things as we close out the show, just a few different ways. Again, I talked about how you can support the show. If you do want to support the show monetarily or financially, you can do so by going over to our merch shop and getting yourself a t-shirt, hat, sticker, whatever it is. You can get some sweet, sweet swag over at our merch shop. You can also support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the reform gamers and get early uncut access to our shows, behind the scenes and more. And then we'd also love to connect with you. You can do so by going to our website, the reform reformgamers.com that gives you some articles and resources that you can use as a Christian uh, that answers different topics such as like you know how much gaming is too much gaming or video games childish and those kind of things and it also keeps you up to date with the news as well because Mike is killing it with our news over there you can also connect with us on Twitter twitter.com slash TRG podcast you can like us on Facebook you can join our Facebook group you can join our discord server you can follow us on Instagram links to all that will be in your show notes and last but not least you can also follow me on twitch twitch.tv slash the theologian stream every tuesday wednesday and friday in the afternoons and we just kind of hang out we'll play some retro games and we'll uh i don't know I, we might play legend of zelda on there if we're not doing that already by the time this episode comes out but twitch.tv slash the theologian you can follow me on there and interact with me and talk to me directly on there as well so if you want if you have a question about gaming or gaming industry or the podcast or how to start a podcast or anything like that feel free to drop into my twitch chat and ask and we spend a lot of time 
Usually we spend the first hour and a half of the stream just hanging out and just chatting, talking about different things. And, uh, and yeah, and actually I just real, I just remembered I hit 50 subs on Twitch the other day. And so I have to fulfill my obligation of making this abomination of a burger where the brownie or brownie is, is the patties. Cool whip is the topping and there's chocolate chips in the burger patty itself. So we'll be streaming that me making that and eating it and it'll be, It'll be interesting. So be sure to stay tuned for that over on twitch.tv slash the theologian. But with that being said, dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the Reformed Gamers. Be a dear, keep it locked here, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Reformed Gamers, the podcast all about theology and gaming. TRG is edited by Dear Ear Productions, so thank them for the buttery smooth tones in your ear. If you're looking for extra content, head on over to youtube.com slash the Reformed Gamers. The Reformed Gamers is entirely fan-supported over on Patreon.com slash Reformed Gamers by our dear patrons. The following dear are at the producer level or higher and will forever be thanked at the end of each show. As long as their pledge comes through, or we forget to update the audio. Those people are Mr. Butts, Caleb, Alex Castellanos, Pastor Shea, and Wesley Ray. Thank you for your support on Patreon.com, keeping our controllers charged, and supporting Logan in his never-ending quest to collect them all. Platinum trophies, that is. So be a deer, and keep it locked here. Keep listening. We'll catch you later.